real quickly. And we are good. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna to leave my video on just for a second so you can see who's talking to you today. Um, and I'm excited that you joined us for another Witch Grass is Witch webinar. So if this is your first time joining us for Witch Grass is Witch, welcome. If you joined our webinar series last fall, welcome back. Um, today we are going to be looking at cool season grasses and the reason why is because those are the grasses that are getting ready to flower right about now. I actually got a little distracted on my drive to work this morning because there were so many grasses that just as of today I noticed were blooming on the roadside on my way into work. So just to give you a little background about myself, Right now, I am an energy and environmental stewardship educator for U of I Extension, but before my time with Extension, I did field work um, for the Nature Conservancy and then um, completed my master's degree at SIU. And during that time, I did a lot of um, field identification of grasses in the monitoring work and research that I was doing. So the approach that we're gonna take with grass identification is those field identification factors. So we're not going to need to use a microscope or get into many small minute details. We're gonna to try to keep it as basic as we can. Now I will say lately, I have been using a hand lens um, just to magnify and make grass ID characteristics a little bit easier to see. But for the most part, everything we're gonna talk about today, you should be able to see um, just with your naked eye. So I'm gonna stop my video and we will go ahead and jump right in. So before we talk about which grass is which, let's talk about what makes the grass a grass. So grasses are monocots, and that's a group of plants, unlike the flowering plants that we have, the dicots. And you can tell a monocot because they have one cotyledon or seed leaf when they start to germinate. So in this tray of grass seedlings, hopefully you can see that each individual leaf seedling, um, grass seedling, excuse me, has a single leaf. Monocots also have parallel veins in their leaves, and that's a characteristic that you can very easily see on a grass. So that just helps us narrow down um, that we're looking at a monocot. Other characteristics of grasses, unfortunately, is that they don't have showy flowers. And this makes it hard for us because we can't grab that colorful flower ID guide and thumb through to find what plant we're looking at. Um, here we have a big blue stem in bloom. And if you weren't looking for it, you may miss that it is blooming at this time. Grasses also have something called sheathing leaves. So what we typically think of as a leaf um, is actually only one part of a leaf structure. The leaf actually wraps around the stem and forms a structure called the sheath. And we'll talk about that as we get a little bit further on today. Grasses also have hollow jointed stems. So I like to think of the joint as a kneecap. We also call it a node, but it's the swollen area along the stem here. And looking for those sheathing leaves and those jointed stems can help you differentiate a grass from other grass-like plants like sedges and rushes. So what is a cool season grass? We use this term to describe grasses that are flowering in spring and early summer. Now in general, these grasses grow during the cooler wetter times of the year. So some of them can start growing as early as late in the fall through the winter and then into the spring. It just kind of depends on the species that you're looking at. And then they'll go dormant in the warmer summer and early fall months. We distinguish cool season grasses from warm season grasses and then winter or summer annuals. All right, let's go a little bit more depth into cool season grasses, but stick with me. Um, it may have been a while since your last biology course, but we're going to keep it simple when we talk about photosynthesis. So essentially, there's two main pathways that plants can use to capture carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. And we call those C3 and C4. And it just refers to the amount of carbon that is in the first molecule created in photosynthesis, OK? Three or four. C3 plants are cool season grasses. C4 are warm season, OK? You can also call cool season grasses C3 grasses, 
and warm season C4, but it's a little bit harder to remember. So again, we'll just keep it simple. What does this mean though? Well, this means that grasses with these different pathways are adapted to different environmental conditions. So they're gonna grow at different times of the year. So to compare them side by side, our C3 or cool season grasses have a higher frost tolerance and higher moisture requirements than warm season grasses, but they also have a lower light requirements and temperature requirements than our warm season grasses. Let's put this into context by looking at an example. Let's compare candid wild rye, which is a cool season or a C3 grass, with big blue stem, which is a warm season or a C4 grass. In the rye, the leaves are gonna emerge in the late winter or into the early spring, and then it will flower and set seeds spring to early summer and go dormant in the summer. In contrast, big blue is going to emerge late spring to summer, flower and set seed in the summer and fall, and then go dormant in the winter, okay? So basically grasses develop at different times of the year based on their different photosynthetic pathway. But why does that matter? Let's look at a practical application of that. Uh, my background has been in um, prairie and grassland monitoring. And in prairies, what you find is the dominant grasses are typically warm season C4 grasses. The invasive and non-native grasses that move in are cool season grasses. Why are they able to establish? It's because they don't have to compete with those warm season grasses when they're growing earlier in the year. So there are um, management um, considerations that can revolve around understanding um, the different types of grasses that you have in a landscape. Okay. Let's move on to laying the foundation of some terms that we should be familiar with. And if you've been in a previous Which Grass is Which webinar, this will be a great review for you. But if we look at the diagram on the right, we can see a sketch of a grass. The portion on the top is called the inflorescence or the flowering head of the grass. We're gonna skip that for right now and look at the vegetative part of the grass, okay? So in the center, we have the stem. A grass stem can also be called a comb, but we're gonna keep it simple, we'll call it a stem. And along the stem, you should be able to find leaves. And as we mentioned earlier, leaves are made up of a few different parts. We have a leaf blade, and then that blade wraps around the stem to form a structure called the sheath. Where that sheath ends, we have that swollen joint or that node. Another term to point out is the collar region, which is circled, and that's the area where the leaf blade becomes the sheath. There are some good identification features to look for in the collar region. But let's look at what this looks like on an actual grass. So in this photo, we have a leaf blade. The blade forms a sheath and wraps around the stem. Here I've pulled that sheath back, but here's our sheath. We have our main stem here. And the reason that I pulled this leaf blade back in this picture was to look at this structure right here. And that structure is called a ligule. So ligules form in that collar region, right, where the blade becomes the sheath, and they can come in many different forms. The most typical forms are a ring of hairs or a membrane. So I have some illustrations here. Um, we've got some different hairy ligules that are present in these grasses, and then we have some membranous ligules. Membranous ligules can be short or they can be rather tall, but not every grass has a ligule. So sometimes finding that you don't have a ligule is a great identifying characteristic. Um, based on the grasses we're gonna look at today, I believe almost all of them has a ligule. So not finding one um, will help narrow down your search quite quickly. Um, so those are just some examples of ligules, and we'll look at a lot of them as we go through today. And there are two other characteristics that are less common, but helpful if you see them, and those are called oracles and horns. Oracles are extra leafy material at the base of the leaf blades that look like arms, and they wrap around or hug the stem. You can see a great example in this photo here. As you pull that leaf blade back, you'd see those oracles open up and unwrap. 
from around the stem. And then the other characteristic is something called horns, and it's stiff U-shaped plant material um, that arises from the leaf sheath here, okay? Um, we're not going to look at grasses that have horns today, but we will look at quite a few that have oracles. All right, so let's look at that inflorescence. Remember, that's the flowering head of the grass. And here, the stem becomes a structure called the rachis, okay? So the rachis is just the main stem of the inflorescence. From the rachis, you can have branches and but you don't have to, and we'll look at that shortly. Um, and the main flowering unit of an inflorescence of a grass is called a spikelet, okay? Um, you can see that pictured here. The spikelet is where you have the flowers that will then develop into the seeds. And there's a lot of terms and parts of spikelets that we're not gonna get into. So there's florets, there's glooms, there's lemons. There's paleos, and we're not going to look at any of that. That is where you definitely need a hand lens and a lot of times a microscope. So we're going to collectively call the flowering unit of a grass a spikelet. Okay, if a spikelet is held on a stalk, the stalk is called a pedestal. Okay, so our stem turns into a rachis. We can have spikelets held on pedestals. All right. There are three main types of inflorescences, and just by asking a few questions, we can start to narrow down what inflorescence type we're looking at, which will help us when we're distinguishing between our grasses. So our first question that we're going to ask is if our rachis is branching. If it is, then we have a panicle. That was easy. So a panicle is an inflorescence whose main stem or rachis branches, okay? Our spikelets can either be held on a pedestal or a stalk, or they can be directly attached to the branch. So we have two different sketch examples of panicles here. The leftmost is the most typical um, um, type of panicle, usually very open and airy and branched. Um, but sometimes you can have ones that look like the drawing on the right, where the branches are long and may look like a stalk or a pedestal, okay? Going back to our main question, if our rachis is not branched, we have another question. Are our spikelets stalked or held on those pedestals or are they not? If they are, we call it a racine. If they're not, we call it a spike, okay? Spike is maybe the easiest one to identify because you have an unbranched rachis and spikelets directly attached to it. That's very simple, okay? The raceme is kind of the catch-all, um, and it's a little bit tricky to understand, but as we go through our examples today, hopefully you'll start to pick up on um, the differentiation between panicles, racemes, and spikes. So in a raceme, you don't have a branched rachis, and then your spikelets are held on a pedestal, but sometimes it's an entire collection of spikelets held on a pedestal. Um, so let's move to some, some examples of real grasses to try to illustrate this. So in the left, we have examples of panicles. In the top, this is that open, airy, branched inflorescence, very typical of a panicle. And in the bottom, we have these longer branches that are curved to the side. In the center, we have examples of racemes. So in the top, we have a spikelet that is on a small pedestal or stalk. Here's an example of where we have a bunch of spikelets, but they're all arranged together and that arrangement is held on a pedestal, okay? So that's the other form of racine that you often see. And then on the right, we have examples of spikes. So we have our spikelets directly attached to our main rachis. Now there's one last characteristic of inflorescences that we're gonna look at, and that is something called ons. So ons are an extension of the edge of a spikelet that resembles a bristle, but bristles are different. We'll look at those on the next slide. Ons can take many different shapes and sizes, as you can see in this illustration here. Um, and it's important to realize that the on emerges from the tip of the spikelet 
you can see here. Bristles are in a different location, and we'll compare that on the next slide. So here you can see some different examples of ons. They come in different colors. They come in different um, numbers. So sometimes you can have two ons emerging from a spikelet, and they come in many different sizes. This one right here um, gets about seven inches tall, so that's a very long on. And looking at the type and arrangement and direction that the ons are facing is another great way to tell grasses apart. So remember what an on looks like. We're going to compare that to a bristle. In a bristle, your spikelet is surrounded at the base by bristles. So what that means is it's not like an on that's extending from the tip, but you can pluck your spikelet out and still leave your bristles intact below it. Okay. They're very common in foxtails. Um, we're not going to talk about foxtails today, um, so we're not going to look at any grasses with bristles, but just to differentiate between those structures. All right, so we made it through our grass ID terms, and if you need a review, um, that was one of the handouts that was sent to you prior, so use that as your reference um, for reviewing the different terms. But we're going to get lots of practice looking at these structures as we move through we have about 22 um, cool season grass species today. So let's jump right in. And the first group of grasses that we're going to look at are rye grasses. So there are 10 different species of rye grasses in Illinois. Um, and we're going to look at four of them. Okay. The first one is bottle brush grass, Elemis hystrix. And it's the easiest one to identify if you have the inflorescence, the flowering structure. Okay. It is a native grass and it's typically found in higher quality woods, but if you look at that range map, you can find it in every county in Illinois. It can grow between two and a half to five feet tall and it has leaves and sheaths that are shiny and hairless and sometimes they're red at the base. So it might be hard to see in the center picture, but right at the base of some of these um, stems, you can find red leaf sheaths. Um, other characteristics to note is it has a white membranous ligule and it has oracles. So right there, that's a great clue that we may be looking at a ryegrass. In the spring, what you're going to find is that center picture of that group of leaves. And that really doesn't help you that much. So what I'm going to encourage you to do when you're out identifying grasses at this time of year is to use your context clues. So when I walked up to this bunch of grass last week, I found this dead stalk right here, and it's not in the picture, but what I found was the remains of this inflorescence. So right away, I knew I was looking at bottle brush grass. Um, so use your context clues because they're very helpful, um, especially with the rise. You really need the inflorescences to differentiate them from one another. Okay. Um, so the inflorescence we can see in the photo is a spike, resembles a bottle brush, and it blooms in the summer. To tell the ryegrasses apart, we look at the different arrangement of the spikelets and the ons. So in this case, our um, inflorescence is not densely packed, right? There's spaces between our spikelets. And the spikelets are not held um, straight up. They're held 90 degrees out from the rachis, okay? And then they have those long ons as well, at least an inch long. Okay, so you put all of those characteristics together and we have bottle brush grass. I have a couple more pictures here. Um, this, this top one is in the fall. You can see um, that remaining inflorescence. Um, we have a close up of some of the ons. This is a picture in the spring of the short little membranous ligule in our oracles. And later in the season, this is something to note um, ligules will change color and may fade away, and oracles often fade away late in the season. So in the fall, I found this yellowish looking membrane and no oracles on my bottle brush grass. So the vegetative characteristics are really helpful right now when they're um, fresh and growing um, and emerging out of the ground. Okay, our second rye is Virginia wild rye, Olimus virginicus, also native species, um, but you can find it in savannas, woods, and prairies in both shaded and unshaded areas, and it's not as restricted to high quality places as bottle brush grass. It grows between two and a half to four feet tall, 
And again, its leaves are not really distinctive. Wide, weak, and shiny is how we describe them. That doesn't really help you out that much. Uh, but it has a white membranous ligule and an oracle. But oh no, that sounds like bottle brush grass. So remember, we really need that inflorescence in the case of distinguishing the rise from one another. Um, so in this case, we have another spike, but hopefully you can see that those spikelets are much more densely packed and they're held straight up um, or relatively straight up. They're not held 90 degrees out from the stem. And in this case, our ons are also shorter. So they're gonna be less than an inch. Another characteristic uh, is that oftentimes the inflorescence in Virginia wild rye is, is um, we call it exerted or pushed out right above a leaf. So you can see in this, that's usually not typical. Usually the leaves are further down on the stem, but with this grass, for whatever reason, it usually um, has a leaf right at the base of the inflorescence. So that's another clue to help you out. Okay, um, silky wild rye is next, um, Elemis villosus, another native ryegrass found in woods and savannas. Um, in every county in Illinois. Um, this one grows about three feet tall, so it's a little bit shorter than some of our others and has wide, slightly hairy leaves and leaf sheaths with hairs as well. So right now we have one distinguishing characteristic from the rest of the, the rise, which is looking for hairiness. Okay, you can also find oracles and a membranous ligule on this ryegrass. And in the summer, it's gonna produce the nodding spike that you see on the left. This is the one that I found last week that was left over from last year. Um, in this case, the inflorescence is, is always going to nod. Okay, it's not going to be held straight up. And its ons are a little bit more open than in Virginia wild rye. Okay, but again, in this one, we're not going to find that leaf right next to the inflorescence as well. Okay. And our last rye is Canada wild rye. Again, you can find it in every county in Illinois. Grows three to five feet tall. Same leaf characteristics. It has that short membranous ligule and oracles. Um, but in this case, um, the inflorescence is really what does it. So the inflorescence will always droop. And as it dries, the ons will curve backwards, OK? Um, so that curved um, on is really the distinctive characteristic for this grass, as you can tell in all of the photos. So just to recap those, because that was a lot about rye grasses, we'll put them side by side. Remember, the, the distinguishing characteristic is in the inflorescences. If they're held straight up or if they droop, if our spikelets are held straight up or held out, and then the length and direction that the ons are facing, okay? So in your handout, you have this side-by-side -side photo as well that hopefully will help you differentiate between those four. Okay, moving on, um, we have squirrel tail barley, also known as foxtail barley. And at first glance, it may look similar to the rise, but it's in a different genus. Um, you can find it almost across the entire state and it prefers disturbed areas. So when I've seen this one before, um, it's been in this disturbed field in this picture, or it's very common on roadsides as well. Um, it grows only one to two feet tall, so it's a much shorter species, and it has short, narrow leaves and a membranous ligule. Hopefully you can see the membranous ligule in this photo. It will flower early to midsummer, and its spike inflorescence is usually about three inches long and it's gonna nod to the side, okay? Um, the spikelets have those very long ons as well that you can see in the photo. Okay, next up, we're gonna look at two different brome species. So our first one is hairy woodland brome, Bromus pubescens. There are 20 different species of bromes across our state, and many of them are non-native. But this one is native and it's the most common one that you can find across the state. And you can find it in woodlands, savannas, bottomland and floodplain areas. I took some pictures of this one right in a little disturbed area behind my office actually. 
Um, it can grow between two and a half to four feet tall. And um, the hairiness of its leaves and sheets is variable, but I was lucky enough to find this very hairy specimen. Um, so you can see just how many hairs there are. And I wanna point something out with this grass. Um, at first glance, this part of the grass, it looks like the stem, right? But oftentimes it's actually the leaf sheath that's extending. So in some grasses, the leaf sheaths can kind of um, overlap each other. Um, so if this description said that the grass had smooth stems, but hairy leaf sheets, it might throw you off a little bit. So I just wanted to point that out. And an easy way to tell is you can just peel this leaf sheath back and see if the stem underneath is smooth or not, okay? Um, it has a short membranous ligule, and then it has a panicle of drooping on spikelets. It's gonna bloom late spring to early summer. And there are a couple other bromes that look similar, but they're much leafier. So this one typically only has about four to seven leaves and the other ones have upwards of nine. Okay, our next brome, oops, I'm jumping ahead. Um, just wanted to show some more hairiness. And here you can see um, I have a smooth stem and then underneath this is my hairy leaf sheath. In the bromes, oftentimes you'll find a crimp, and I realize this is not in focus in this part of the leaf new camera, my apologies, um, but hopefully you can kind of see the crimp that's there. Um, I wouldn't put too much stock into the colors that you see. A lot of the times new grass growth is kind of reddish in color. Um, so I wouldn't use that as an identification feature. Okay, now we're on to our next brome, smooth brome. Um, this one, unfortunately, is non-native, um, and you can find it in disturbed areas. Um, prairie restorations is a very common location, um, and then in some savannas as well. It grows between two to three and a half feet tall, and it definitely has that distinctive M-shaped crimp. And that's the main identification feature that I use for this species in conjunction with its habitat, and if I find a huge monoculture or a giant patch of it. It kind of clues me in that it's smooth brown. Um, it has a short membranous ligule, and then it has a panicle um, of those elongated greenish red spikelets, and that will bloom early to midsummer. And then later in the season, it's going to curve to the side. Okay, um, so this is kind of a typical uh, growth pattern of smooth brown. When you find an infestation of it. It'll just be leaves upon leaves upon leaves. And then here you can see all the inflorescences. Um, so definitely one to look out for. And in the fall, um, the leaves curl very tightly when they dry and it rustles really distinctively in the wind. So if you find this inflorescence paired with those curled dead leaves, and you might find some hanging around still right now, almost in May from last year. So use that to help you when you're looking at just the new grass blades. All right, we're moving right along. Um, so next up, we're going to look at three species of panic grasses. Now, these panic grasses are in a genus called Dicanthelium. And they used to be lumped with other grasses in the Panicum genus, but they've since been separated out. So in um, the Dicanthelium's, we have 33, give or take a few species in Illinois. And they're kind of notorious for being difficult to tell apart, but I'm going to show you the easiest three. And one of them is actually like the easiest grass for me to identify. So I have faith that you can, can take one of these and remember how to ID it. So first up is deer tongue grass, Dicanthelium clandestinum. It is a native species found in woods, savannas, and prairies, and it'll grow one to four feet tall. And it has very stiff, long hairs on the leaf sheaths. Um, you can see its broad leaves clasp or wrap around the base of the stem, and then they're pointed on the tip. While the leaf sheaths are hairy, the stems and the nodes are not. So again, at first glance, it looks like our stem is hairy, but here you can see that it's actually smooth and our node is also smooth. It has a inflorescence, that's a panicle of rounded spikelets. 
And the dicamphaliums are very interesting because they bloom twice in the season. So the first is going to be that, that panicle at the tip of the plant, okay, that will bloom early to midsummer. This grass is going to continue growing throughout um, the summer. And unlike many of our other cool season grasses, it's a little bit different. Um, and when it gets around late summer, it's going to be about three or four feet tall. So when it blooms the first time, it's only about one to two feet tall. It will continue growing. And then it produces these secondary panicles that are kind of partially enclosed in a leaf. And they're um, self-crossing um, flowers that are used as a backup plan. So that's a unique characteristic of the dicantheliums. All right. Bosque's panic grass is the easiest grass for me to identify. I'm going to say that about one other as well, but this one is right up there. Um, it's also called large fruited panic grass, um, and it has the widest leaf blades of all of the grasses in the dicanthelium genus. So you can get a feel for how wide those blades are in this photo. It's native found in rocky woods, glades, and bluffs down in my area, down in Southern Illinois. Um, it grows between one and two and a half feet tall. And you can see that it has clasping leaves. So the way you identify this one is because it has something called a retrorsley bearded node. Retrorsley means downward facing, bearded means hairy, and node is that joint. So we have downward facing white hairs on the node of the grass. And that's all I need to look for to know that I'm looking at Bosque's panic grass. You can kind of see it in this photo here. But that's the only thing that I look for, and then I move on. If you need more characteristics, you can look for its panicle of those large round spikelets, and it has purple anthers, which is really pretty. It's going to bloom late spring to summer and then produce those secondary panicles. So here we have a close up where you can see the purple color, you can see that hairy node, and over here you can see the clasping leaves. All right, our third. Panic grass or dicanthelium um, doesn't have a common name. We just call it panic grass. Um, dicanthelium laxiflorum, and it's a native of woodlands. Again, pretty restricted down in southern Illinois, but where you find it, it is very abundant. Um, it forms a very short, under six inches bunch grass, and the leaves are very relaxed. So they just kind of lay on the ground. As you can see in the pictures, it's extremely hairy. The leaf blades and the sheaths, everything about it is very hairy. And then it produces the small spikelets in a panicle that are right here on the right, it blooms in the spring, and then will produce secondary pan panicles that bloom in the fall. Okay, next up is inland oats, also known as river oats or sea oats. Um, I like to call it uh, I don't like to call it sea oats because you know, we're in the Midwest, <laughs> but river oats is an apt name as well. Um, it's the only species in its genus in our state and found kind of central on down south. It is native and you find it in moist areas. It has broad leaves um, and grows between one and a half to four feet tall. And it has a short hairy ligule. It produces a panicle inflorescence that droops and has very distinctive flattened spikelets. So you can see those in the middle photo. So even though it's a cool season grass, it takes a bit longer to mature and it actually seeds out in the summer to fall. So as you're probably seeing, plants don't always follow the rules. Um, so this is one of those that is not going to seed until the fall, but it's technically considered a cool season grass. And it will turn golden in color in the fall. When I was out taking photos last week, I noticed this clump of grasses and thought it was really striking and you can really see the dark green um, veins in the leaves and I went, I can't, I can't tell what that is. Well, I stepped back and I used my context clues and this is what I saw and I went, oh, it's river oats. It's very easy. So again, look for what's remaining. You can see the remains of over here, those flattened spikelets and then compare it to the grass that's growing up underneath it. Okay, this is my second most easy grass to identify, poverty oat grass. It's again, the only species in its genus in our state, and it has a 
a more restricted range in that it's found in rocky woods, glades, and prairies. Um, and all you have to do is look at the dead leaves. All you have to do is look for a bunch grass with all of these tight corkscrew dead leaves. That's the only thing I ever look at, but because I was giving this talk, I decided to look a little bit closer. So it does have a short membranous ligule. You can't see it in this photo. What you see is these this tuft of white hairs. And at first I thought, oh, it's a hairy ligule, but looking closer, the hairs are on the outside of the leaf sheath and, and right at that juncture, kind of where the oracle would be. But there is a membranous ligule in there as well. And then it will develop a panicle inflorescence with on spikelets in late spring to early summer. So I have not ever seen it in flower myself and it's the perfect time. So I need to go out and check and see if I can see it in bloom. Here are some other pictures. It's a little bit, unless you're looking for it, it's a little bit hard to see. You can see um, how small the bunches of the grass are. But now that I'm a little bit more accustomed to looking for it, I see it all over the place where when I'm hiking in, in Southern Illinois. Okay, next up is wood reed, and there are two species in its genus in Illinois. It's a native of wetter areas, including floodplain woods, swamps, and woodland openings. It's going to grow about three to five feet tall, and when the leaves grow, they droop near their tips. Okay, so they're not going to be held up or straight out. They kind of droop at the tip, and it does have a membranous ligule. These photos were taken in the fall, so that ligule is turned brown. The panicle, which can get up to 12 inches tall, it's quite large, it has upward facing branches. You can kind of see um, here that the branches face upwards. Um, and it's another cool season grass that isn't going to follow the rules and it's gonna bloom in the fall. But if you were out now, you'd see that foliage emerging. Um, you can tell this species apart from the other cinna in the genus because its foliage is really gray green and the spikelets do have an on. It's very difficult to see, but they have a, they call it a barely noticeable on. Um, so it's just a little bit of a, a point at the tip of the spikelets. So that's wood reed. We're gonna switch from being in the woods to going out into the prairie. So next is porcupine grass. Um, it is one of two in its genus in our state and found in prairies, savannas, and pastures. It grows about two and a half, three and a half feet tall, um, and it grows in clumps. It has a tall membranous ligule that can get up to a half an inch tall. So that's quite a tall ligule. Um, and then it produces an inflorescence that's a nodding panicle, so it's going to bend to the side, and it blooms late spring to early summer. And it's Spikelets have awns that can be up to seven and a half inches long. And the purpose of these awns is they twist as they dry. You can kind of see the twisting happening here. And it serves as a drill to drill that seed into the soil. Make sure you untangle these seeds if you are seed collecting. Otherwise, you'll have one big twisted mass of porcupine grass seeds, speaking from experience. Um, you can distinguish it from needle and thread grass, which is the other grass in the genus, um, because that grass has shorter ligules and shorter bonds. So here again, you can see the tall ligule and then just pictures of the inflorescence and those really long bonds. All right, June grass is up next, and it is again the only species in its genus in Illinois, native and found in prairies, savannas, and limestone glades. This one's much shorter. It only grows about six to 18 inches tall, and it blooms late spring to early summer, hence the name June grass. The leaves have a prow shaped tip or a boat shaped tip. So think about the end of a canoe. Um, and the leaves, including the blades and the sheaths, have short fuzzy hairs on them. It also has a white membranous ligule. So at first glance, it might look like a hairy ligule. Um, this one is a little bit torn apart, but it is membranous, and you can see those hairs here. And then it will produce um, an inflorescence that's a dense panicle, 
And um, <clears throat> this is it in full bloom in the center. And then as um, it senesces or dies later in the season, this is what it's gonna look like. Here's some more pictures. Um, you can, it's not really clear. You can kind of see the tip of the leaf um, and then just how fuzzy hairy um, the sheaths are. All right, we're almost there. Just a few more species left. We're gonna move into um, some of our non-native species that you can find. And these are the ones that I saw blooming on the roadside today. First up is Kentucky bluegrass, Poa pretensis. And it's one of 18 bluegrass species in Illinois. And they're challenging to tell apart if you don't use a microscope. So I'm gonna talk about two, um, but I myself um, have just seen some in bloom and I kind of stopped at, well, it's a bluegrass and that's about as far as I'm gonna get. And I'm okay with that. Um, so you may be familiar with this. It could be your lawn grass. Um, and while it has the word Kentucky in its name, it's actually non-native from Europe, commonly found in pastures, degraded prairies, open woods, and basically everywhere that you go. Um, it will grow between one to two and a half feet tall if you're not constantly mowing it. And it has thin leaves with a boat shaped tip. You can really see that shape in that photo. Um, the stem is round and that's important when we get to the next grass and it has a panicle inflorescence that blooms in late spring to early summer. Um, now, lately I've been asked how to tell this grass apart from fescue. And one of the easiest ways is to look at the leaf. And in Kentucky bluegrass, you have just this one vein down the center, whereas in fescue, you'd see a whole bunch of veins. There's not like a prominent midrib like there is in bluegrass. Okay, so next is Canada bluegrass, um, also non-native, uh, that has many of the same characteristics, basically all of the same characteristics as Kentucky bluegrass. And the way that I tell them apart is Canada bluegrass has a flattened stem. So if you tried to roll the stem between your fingers, um, it would just go side to side, but wouldn't just smoothly roll between your fingers. Everything else is the same though, short membranous ligule, boat shaped tip, um, and panicle inflorescence. <clears throat> All right, another one that if you see it in bloom may resemble a bluegrass um, is red top. And there are seven different species in the Agrostis genus in Illinois. Um, red top is non-native, found in degraded prairies and moist meadows. It's a slender grass that grows two to three feet tall. Um, and if you remember how skinny the bluegrass leaves are, red top leaves are much wider. Um, so if you look at the size of the grass, the leaves seem almost too wide for it. And it has a, and the leaves have a pointed tip, not a boat shaped tip. So that's our first clue that it's not a bluegrass. Um, and it also has a much taller ligule than bluegrasses do. Um, I also recently learned it has red nodes. So red top not only has a reddish looking inflorescence, but it also has red nodes. Okay, um, you, we can see the panicle is, uh, has red spikelets and they have a silky texture if you're able to feel it. And it's gonna develop in late spring to midsummer. Here's some more pictures of that tall ligule um, and then the inflorescence, very reddish in color. In this case, color is a good defining feature for this grass. The blue grasses aren't blue, but red top is red. That's not confusing at all. <laughs> all right, tall fescue is up next. Um, it recently underwent a name change. Well, not so recently anymore, um, but I still call it uh, Festuca aradinacea. Um, it is non-native and can be found in fields, roadsides, and forest openings. It may be um, an unwanted grass in your lawn, or you may have a fescue lawn. Um, it's commonly planted for forage as well. Um, it can grow about six feet tall, and one good identifying feature is its leaves often remain green deep into the winter and then green up very early in the spring. It is a bunch grass, and with this one, I find the leaves are rather stiff and sharply angled at the collar. Um, so you might be able to tell from this picture, but compared to other leaves that we've looked at, they're not floppy. Um, they're, they're very stiff and held um, very strongly away from the stem. 
And um, it does have a short membranous ligule. It's very short. You can barely see it in this photo. And um, blunt oracles. So not long extended oracles, but kind of like a little projection that's almost not even there. <laughs> so really blunt oracles. I wouldn't use that as your main identification feature. Um, and it will produce um, a panicle inflorescence. And I don't have a picture of one. And I saw them in full bloom on the side of the road. So I wish I had my camera with me. Um, here you can see the spike that's just starting to emerge. That was a week ago. Um, it will, when it dries, let me move to the next slide. When it dries, it will look like a spike, but it is a panicle. Uh, and you can see this is what it looks like this time of year. Um, I took this picture right behind some relatively recent construction um, out at a trailhead. And you can see just these bunches of bright green um, grass with these really stiffly held um, leaves. Okay, quack grass is next. Elemis repens, a non native found in pastures, abandoned fields, and roadsides, grows about one to two feet tall. It has a short membranous ligule and it has oracles and ones that we can actually see, not those blunt ones like on the fescue. Um, the inflorescence develops in the summer. Um, I call it a spike, but technically it's a raceme. So in that case is me and many others call it a spike-like raceme, okay? Um, and the rachis appears to zigzag. Hopefully you can see that if you look closely. Here we have some more pictures just of the foliage. You can see it has rather wide leaves, pointed tips, um, and again, our inflorescence. Timothy is next. It's the only species in its genus in Illinois. This is another one I saw blooming on the roadside right now. It grows two to three and a half feet tall, and its foliage is often gray green in color a little bit later in the season. It has a membranous ligule that we can see here and here. And then its inflorescence is a spike. And the spikelets have these really short awns um, that make the spikelet appear to have a U-shape. And the best example is right here, if you can see this U-shaped um, pairing of awns. When it is flowering, it'll look like this. Um, and I believe, if I remember correctly, this is one that is a source of um, some allergies. So if you have really bad allergies and you have a big patch of Timothy, that could be why. Okay, our last grass for today is reed canary grass. And this one is listed as invasive, an invasive plant of concern by the Midwest Invasive Plant List in Illinois. It can be found in swamps, marshes, and moist meadows, so wet areas. And there are debates on this plant on where it's native to, because it's native to Europe, parts of Asia, and possibly Northwestern US. But Northwestern US isn't Illinois, um, so it is listed in our state um, because it's very aggressive. It grows between three to five feet tall and has rather wide um, leaf bases where they wrap around the grass to form the sheath. Um, it has a white membranous ligule, and then its inflorescence is a panicle of spikelets that both before it's fully developed and after it blooms resembles a spike. Um, so in the picture, you can see this is all the same grass. These inflorescences right here, they're, they're not fully open yet. Um, so it looks spike-like, but then in the back, we can see that they've opened and they're, they're clearly a panicle. That's another thing to keep in mind, depending on what stage of that grass's life cycle that you find it in. If it's just starting, to develop its inflorescence, it may look very different than when it's fully developed. So if it's supposed to droop, it may still be held straight up and it hasn't gotten to the point where it's drooping yet. So if there's a grass you really want to identify, I would watch it. Just visit that site multiple times if you can to see how it develops through the season. But for this grass, basically I use the location and how it's growing. So here you can see it's a huge monoculture and this is right next to a stream. Um, again, you can see the two different versions of that inflorescence here. Okay, we made it through our grasses. I hope you're not overwhelmed. And if you are, that's okay. 
Um, the goal is not to learn 22, however many we did today, new grass species in one sitting. It's to, to learn those tips and tricks and characteristics to look for. And if you leave remembering one, that's great. That's a great start. So just a review, when we're looking at a grass, what types of characteristics do we look for? If you have the inflorescence, start there. Try to figure out what type you have, a panicle or a seam or a spike, and then look for those ons and see um, how they're arranged, how big they are, what color they are. And if you don't have an inflorescence or you want some more clues, look at, look at those leaf characteristics. So see if you have a ligule and if it's hairy or if it's membranous, how big it is. Um, see if there are oracles. And then just look for hairs. Are there hairs? where um, are they long are they really short um, are they held out from the stem or are they held up next to the stem okay all of those can help you narrow it down um, we didn't talk too much about color but sometimes color and and not like red and blue but like a grayer green or a bluer green and you may think that that's not a big enough <laughs> distinction, but with some grasses, some grasses that are blue-green really stand out from everything around them. So, so look for that as well. I wanted to share a couple resources for you. Um, unfortunately, my favorite grass identification guide is an unpublished draft um, that I received seven years ago, and I've been waiting, and it has never yet been published. So unfortunately, I can't share that one with you. Um, but if you're just getting started out, Grasses um, by Lauren Brown. It's um, my version's a little bit outdated with the names. The names of a lot of the grasses have been changed over the years, um, but it's a really great start. It has sketches of grasses. And while you may think that pictures are better, a lot of times sketches actually are when you're starting. Um, so I encourage you to, you know, see if you can get that from your local library or look it up and see if you can get an inexpensive copy. Um, these days, I mostly use the Illinois Wildflowers webpage. Tons of great information, very detailed information, and helps you distinguish between different grasses that look similar. Um, so those are kind of my two main go-tos um, for right now. And with that, I wanna thank you all for joining me today. Um, we do ask if you have just a couple minutes, we very much appreciate any feedback that you have. Um, we're still uh, transitioning into the webinar world and especially with, with webinars like this one where I'd much rather be on a hike with you all, um, we're always looking on ways to improve. So you can either scan that QR code or visit go.illinois.edu slash cool season grass eval. And we will follow up with an email with that information as well. Um, if you just wanna wait to get the link emailed, then you can click it. So Kim, we have um, some time. If there are any questions, um, we can go ahead and um, answer some of those. Thank you, Erin, that was a great presentation. Um, I am waiting for some questions in the chat. Um, one was just about some technicalities with using Box. Um, a user was having difficulty getting the handouts. Do you have any recommendations of how to um, get the handouts? I did share the links in the chat. Um, yeah, if you can email me directly, my email's on the screen. I can try to figure that out with you. Um, sometimes it's challenging, but some of the files are a little too big to email, so that's why we, we go the link route. <laughs> um, but we'll work it out. Just send me an email and we'll get it fixed. The next question I have is, um, does Casmanthium latifolium have any wildlife value? Um, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. That's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think if the seeds would be eaten or if they're too rough. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to go with the, I'm not sure <laughs> answer. Uh, and I think, I think for my, for my knowledge, um, of these grasses are really important for some of our um, Lepidoptera species. I don't know the exact um, species, but 
um, moths and butterflies will feed on that vegetation. And that's, Kim, that's a great point. At that Illinois Wildflowers webpage as well, it has information about known relationships between the plants and any um, insects or other critters. I just didn't add that in. So if you wanted to visit that website and look that up, um, if there is anything that's been found in the research, it would probably be listed there. Um, another question. Mm -hmm. Um, they missed the warm season grass presentation. Is it posted on the YouTube channel? Yes, so we have not done warm season yet. Um, in the fall, I did, um, I organized the grasses by habitat. So we did a woodland grass ID, we did a prairie grass ID, and then we kind of did a nuisance grass ID. Um, so a lot of the species we talked about today were repeated there. We're just reorganizing it. So we're doing cool season in the spring. Warm season, I will be doing later in the summer. So you are now on my grass uh, email list. So you will get an email when that one is put out. And I'm also toying around with doing a, a, a summer annual um, webinar if I could put together enough grasses. So stay tuned. Um, you, you didn't do anything wrong. It's coming. Uh, but you can always check out those webinars that are posted on um, U of I's YouTube channel as well. Do you have a recommendation on an app to use on your phone to identify broadleaf weeds and or grasses? Um, so I generally don't use apps myself. Um, I'm not sure how good iNaturalist is at grasses, um, but that's one that I'm trying to get into <laughs> for identifying plants um, because there will be other people that can look at the picture that you submit and then give you suggestions on um, what type of plant it is. But in general, unfortunately, I don't really have any app recommendations. What category does Japanese grass fall into? And I'm my assumption is Japanese stilt grass. With if yeah, if it's Japanese stilt grass, I believe it's a. It's it well. It's, mm, <laughs> I think it's a warm season, but it's also an annual. So I'm going to say I'm not sure off the top of my head on that one. I don't know if it'd be considered a summer annual. Um, according to um, the interwebs, I have it as an early germinating warm season annual. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> uh, I posted the YouTube channel for U of I extension in the chat for you all. Um, I'm going to jump in, Kim, because I see a comment about northern sea oats that they have, that they bought. It's very invasive and seeds everywhere. Is it a good grass or bad? I thought it was native. So sea oats is native, but it is very aggressive. So if you plant it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's used a lot in landscaping, but it is a spreader. Um, so if you have it in your um, landscaping, I would suggest cutting the seed heads off and putting them in a plastic bag in the garbage if you don't want it to continue spreading. Um, that's one way you can kind of keep it in check. But yes, just because something is native, that doesn't mean it's not aggressive. Um, so it can still spread and take over um, your landscape. Well, thank you very much for um, answering these questions. If anybody has one last question, we're happy to field it. Otherwise, we want to be very respectful of your time today. We ended on time. That's great. Yeah. I left time for questions. That's always hard for me. <laughs> Oops. 
Well, all right, I think we'll end it for today. So thank you everyone for joining us and um, look forward, stay tuned for warm season grasses later this year. Take care everyone.